So today we're at the end of the, Paul's first letter to the church in Thessalonica. It's a short one, short letter, even though 2 Thessalonians is even shorter. But it's full of encouragement and practical wisdom for those who are part of Christ's family. And not just ancient Macedonia, but for us today as well. So it's got a lot for us in here. And I think we need to remember one of the main reasons that Paul, with Silas and Timothy, wrote it in such an encouraging way. I think it has a lot to do with the, the persecution and the troubles that they were in the middle of in that area. Because if you recall from earlier on, we saw that the, the reason Paul had to write to them was, and not visit was that he'd been chased out of town by the Jews who were taking exception to the gospel message. They just couldn't accept that this that criminal Jesus was someone to be worshipped. It just was beyond their capacity to, to see that. So... So when you're under pressure and hurting, a message that lifts your head in hope and comfort is just what you need, isn't it? So that's kind of what the idea of this, this whole letter is. So that's what, we're, we're, what we find, and we'll talk more about that in a little while, the, the lifting the head stuff. But as Paul closes off this letter, he has loads of little instructions to help them along the way. So there's, there's heaps of practical advice for how to live a life in God's family while we're in this hostile world because it was hostile then and there's hostility now so we can certainly use this in our day can't we this while it's around us so Paul writes in a bit of quick fire little tidbits kind of way so it's, it's how the sermon will be as well so we'll just sort of step through them all and so we get straight to it starting out with a couple of verses about how people in the church should relate to church leadership especially elders and pastors so it's a bit weird to preach about this, to be honest. You know, it's like, hey, you should respect me and love me. But, you know, I won't put it like, quite like that. But it is written here, and um, you know, it's my policy to never avoid things, so here we go. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 12. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. So the first point is one of respect. Okay, so... That's to recognize them as indispensable asset, assets to the church. It's not yet about loving them. That comes in the next verse, but certainly they should be held in high esteem. Because anybody, be it an organism or an organization, needs to have a control center, right? Because it's got to function somehow. And yes, I'm definitely quick to point out that the head of the church is Jesus. He's the control center. He's the absolute boss. But under him, each individual fellowship must have some kind of authority arrangement so that responsibility and accountability can make practical sense. And in the spiritual life of the church, God has placed that in the hand of elders, particularly. Yes, there are other leadership positions, and we have, as we have in this church, but in these two verses, it's mainly elders that are in view, the, the spiritual leaders of the church. And just to be clear, biblically, a pastor is one of the elders, so it's treated the same there it's really the same idea used as, as in much of the New Testament it's said, placed, said that way in fact pastors only mentioned once really it's, and um, it's, it's more describes a function okay because pastor relates to the word pastoral in, in English pastoral reflects the meaning that the, the basic meaning of the word is a shepherd you know you're pastoralists and all that so he's a shepherd so a pastor does the shepherding and the church is called the flock. Well, the elders do the shepherding, really. So we're just saying the pastor is the function that they do. Elder is, like I said, the same idea, but that particular word emphasizes the fact that these men need to be spiritually mature. Okay, elder, a bit more mature. Therefore, for their maturity and their function as shepherds, for the good of the whole, they deserve respect. Certainly not disrespect or backbiting or rumors spread against them, stuff like that. That doesn't just hurt the elders, that hurts the church because the whole church are under the elders, right, in that sense. Okay, so on that point, that they are over you in the Lord, you know, the church is under the elders and they are over you in the Lord, in no way should the spiritual leaders be dictators or unapproachable harsh rulers in the church. I hope I don't seem that way. <laughs> Please let me know if I am. But... Um, Yes, they are to admonish folks when necessary, but not to be cruel or doing it for you know, personal gain at all. 
yes, I get paid, but that's, you know, that's a separate issue. I'm talking about making themselves feel superior to people. So the sense that they're over the church is simply that they are ultimately responsible for the health of the fellowship they lead. And as a result, God will judge them with, with greater strictness, as James 3 verse 1 says. And just before I read it, yes, I realize this verse is talking about Bible teachers specifically. But the expectation is that there's much overlap between being elders and pastors and being teachers in the church. Okay, that's clear all the way through the New Testament. So this applies to te the teaching leaders as well as others who have spiritual authority, though perhaps to a slightly lesser degree, but yeah, specifically teachers, but teachers and elders are all together really. So speaking as a leader, James says in chapter 3 verse 1, I'll just show that for you. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Okay, so yes, there's a definite way that God has designed for things to work in the church. And yes, loving your pastor is one of them. So back to 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 13. And to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And the Greek phrase there is more literally, it translates to something like, esteem them, ready, above, out, exceedingly in love. So there's a triple intensification there. Because he could have just said, esteem them in love. That would have got the point across, wouldn't it? Yeah. Paul does that, you know, the emphasis on emphasis thing sometimes. He does it in other places. As, as if he's searching just for the, you know, the, the best way to express a really strong conviction that this is really important. You know, so, and what's the reason? Why is this so important? Well, f it says f for his work as an le as a le elder, it's in his work. And I've got to tell you, there are many blessings in being a pastor, but by the same token, it can be really hard work too. And it's made a fair bit more enjoyable though when there's peace in the fellowship, as he mentions there. So I'm pretty thankful that we're in that kind of position at the moment in, the, in our church. I think it's fair to say we have a fair bit of peace, so that's great. But let's also remember that while the responsibility for the health of the church ultimately falls at the feet of the eldership, the everyday functions of church life are probably more in the hands of the congregation. Well, as much as you know, all of us, we're all equal on this. It's too much for just the elders to do, do the pastoral care of the fellowship. And so Paul moves now in this second section into what we all have to do to improve the health of the local expression of the body of Christ. And the grammar there shows us that he's putting the responsibility for these behaviours at the feet of everyone involved in the church, not just the leaders, which is really just continuing what he started. If you look at the first two verses, he's talking to the church as a whole, so he continues on talking to the fellowship in general. And we'll call this section Living Church Life, starting in verse 14. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. So there we have those instructions, bang, 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 you know, four things just like that. So there's four and a whole bunch more will follow, but we'll just touch on each one of these briefly. Admonish the idol. Did that come up? There we go. So really a better translation of the word idol is unruly. Because the word relates to military situations where a soldier might be out of step with the rest of the group. So the, you know, they're meant to be marching in step and there's someone who's out of step doing his own thing. So we are to be in step, and the one who sets the pace in that is who? Not so much me, is or the, the pastor, as the Holy Spirit, right? Galatians 5.25, you've heard this one. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So he's the one giving the marching orders. And we're all answerable to the Spirit directly, each of us individually as believers. So we should be all taking our marching orders ultimately from him. But certainly the, pastor, certainly the pastor and elders should be leading the way for that. So that's kind of, if you want to picture it that way. So encourage those who are out of step to get in step. Next, encourage the faint-hearted. And the Greek word there is actually a quaint one. It's literally encourage the small-souled. Oh, that's kind of like, mm. um, it kind of says it all, doesn't it, if you're small-souled? <laughs> because this world can definitely compress your soul and dent your courage. And we'll talk a bit more about soul a little bit later on, what it, kind of what it may mean. But 
But in the church, when it's healthy and functioning correctly, we should all be about enlarging people's souls, building their courage, because God is on our side, right? So who can be against us? Was that from Romans? Yeah. So why don't you try and find someone who you can do that for today, try and enlarge their soul, so to speak. Because even if you're feeling a bit small-souled yourself, helping someone else can help build you up too. So that's what church is all about, you know, helping each other. It's part of the blessing of church. That's what God's given us. Next one, help the weak. This is pretty similar to the last one in some ways, but it carries another important image. And the word help there is literally to hold up. So it's kind of the picture of putting your shoulder under your brother or sister and providing the strength that they just don't have right now. If you can picture that kind of situation. And of course the main issue is spiritual and emotional strength rather than physical, even though all aspects are ultimately important, as again we'll see later in verse 23. So the idea is to help them emotionally and, and spiritually to get there. So yes, it's important that we look out for ways to hold up the weak in a day where we have a fair bit of spiritual and emotional fatigue going on. I, I sense that around. So yes, let's hold each other up. Okay, finally, we must be patient with them all. Now this is necessary because we aren't all the same level of spiritual maturity. Just like how not all players on, a, on the, you know, the local level footy team are all the same level of fitness, you know, being polite with that one. <laughs> there's, there's variations in fitness levels, especially at lo local levels, and we need to realise that those who've got a way to go still, well, sometimes we have to wait for them sometimes, you know. It's, we've got to consider other people. Now, there is a difference with someone who's lagging due to spiritual laziness and that might require a little more firmness sometimes, people who are being lazy, but if it's just that they're not there yet, we need to be patient. Just as God is very, very patient with us, right? So let's try and pass a bit of that on down the line. But we can be a bit like this cartoon there sometimes, right? So, Lord, give me patience, but hurry up. And remember, sometimes our hurry is just our own self-invented goal, if you think about it. Uh, what's, what's the hurry sometimes, you know? We just think we've got to get there quicker. But sometimes it's just all in our own head. Often that's not God's goal for someone else. God's work takes time, so we need to be sensitive to his spirit about exactly when to give someone the hurry up and when not to. So it's not just about what we think all the time. So let's have patience with each other. All right, we better pick up the pace if we're going to get through this today. Verse 15. So that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good and to one another and to everyone. So clearly revenge is not for us. God says many times at the, in the Bible that vengeance is mine, right? Vengeance is his, not ours. And the fruits of the vengeful attitude are clear for all to see in the dow downward spiral that is religions like Islam and that kind of thing. I don't know if you noticed the, re the revenge attitude. Anytime one does something to one, they've got a revenge back and then it's revenge back. and then um, So the revenge attitude in that belief system just breeds increasing strife and hatred. But that's not what God seeks, is it? That's not how it's supposed to work. We should seek to do good for each other in the church, especially because they are our fe fellow heirs of God in Jesus, right? But we're also to do good to everyone outside the church as well. And now, granted, sometimes they see our good in a different light, don't they? Things that we intend for good, they sometimes misunderstand. Because they, they come from a position of darkness and they don't see what we see. But still, we do what we can to bless them and act for their ultimate good. Now, for a long time, the last 50 plus years, you know, um, what society has seen good as, and what the church sees good as pretty close, but it's starting to change, isn't it? So we have to be prepared with that. Now the next command is actually the shortest verse in the Bible. You've been told it's John 11.35, haven't you? But it's the shortest in the Greek, okay? It's shorter than Jesus wept, John 11.35, but it's not short on challenge. Verse 16, rejoice always. Now that one can be really hard, can't it? To rejoice always. 
But think about the context of this letter that Paul's writing. How hard was it to be a Christian in first century Thessalonica? It's pretty hard. So remember, Paul was imprisoned and beaten in the nearby town of Philippi just a couple of months before this letter was written, probably. And the time is the probable. He was definitely beaten. <laughs> and then he and his fellow missionaries were run out of Thessalonica in anger by the Jews, right? They kicked him out. And we pick up more of the difficulties of life there in comments like these we've read so far. Now, you might have skimmed over some of these, so we're going to put them all together. And we'll see how hard things were in Thessalonica. Verse, so 1 verse 6. For you received... So notice the blending of joy and hardship here, sorry. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So he's got those two things together there. But the point is I had affliction there. So And then 2 verse 2, just down a bit. But though we had already suffered and been sh shamefully treated at Philippi, speaking of himself there, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. Boldness because they were convinced of the truth of Jesus, right? That's the boldness where it comes from. And then a bit more down, uh, a little further, 2 verses 14 and 15. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. So it would seem that some of them are even being killed. He's trying to draw that parallel there. But they still had joy, Okay. And so Paul kept strong in his instruction, verse 3, verse 3, that no one be moved by these afflictions. So he keeps touching on, he knows that they're having a hard time. And then there's more of the same if we take a sneak peek ahead in 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 4. I'll just show one here, but there's, there's a lot more we'll get to when we get to 2 Thessalonians. But 1, verse 4, Therefore we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. And he goes on there to talk more about what those afflictions mean. But we'll leave that there for now. And um, you see the point, all right? So Paul knows very well that things are hard for the Christians in Thessalonica. So does he just say, all right, just hunker down and try not to worry too much? No. He says, rejoice always. Why? Well, how? How can he say that? Well, it's because our joy isn't based on worldly circumstances. Happiness may well be, but true joy is spiritual, okay? So it's, it's a deeper thing. And the spiritual truths of our adoption by God and the promises that the fire of persecution will serve to purify us and make us better, that's the purpose of this, they're really sufficient for us to be able to have joy that's beyond human logic and the peace that passes understanding, okay? That's just the truth of it. But what are the key elements of experiencing that kind of joy? Other than, obviously, the hard times to make it happen, but what, what are the key elements other than that? Let's move on to 17 and 18. Have a look at that. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Okay, so what does it mean to pray without ceasing? Go around like this all day and run into things? No, of course not. Maybe the most concise way of saying it is just to live your life with the awareness that God is always right there. At no time should you say you can't speak to God. And if you do find yourself in a place where you feel like it's inappropriate to pray, perhaps you're not in the right place. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Perhaps you're where you shouldn't be. So yes, we should always have an attitude of prayer as well as an attitude of gratitude, as they say. So thankfulness is so important. And notice the wording there is not give thanks for all circumstances, which in a sense you can do, but more importantly to give thanks in all circumstances. Okay, whatever the circumstance, we can be thankful, right? Even if it's not for that circumstance specifically, but we can be thankful that we can talk to God in the midst of whatever at any time and that he has promised to bring us to the other side in his good times. I'm thinking, obviously, when things are really hard, he will bring us through that in his good time. And so we can therefore thank him for his promises as well, and that he, as well, and that he keeps them as well. You know, he, he gives the promises, which is great, but he keeps them, which is the most important thing, right? Unlike some insurance companies, but I won't go there. 
And see, once you start listing the things to be thankful for, you can really get lost in the task. It's, it's that long. If Once you start making a list, it's actually a very good thing to do for the soul, really. Make a list of hey, what you can be thankful for. And you'll, you'll run out of time before you'll run out of list. And so those three things in those two verses, joy, prayer, and thankfulness, are all in view when Paul says that this is the will for you of God, actually in three verses. Um, when, when Paul says this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus, they, these are the things that are part of that will, right? Joy, prayer, and thankfulness. So God is with you by his spirit in it all, and we need to re- release ourselves into his protection during the storms of life. Not reject him as being distant and say, you're, not, you're ignoring me, letting me have hard things. Well, hard things are actually part of it, right? So we don't reject him and say, you're ignoring me, which is kind of what verse 19 talks about. Do not quench the spirit. Now, this is so often used, used as a verse to defend the so-called supernatural gifts of the spirit, like tongues and healing and prophecy and so forth. Now, all those things, when genuine, I'll qualify them, when genuine, are fine in their place. And you can go and check out my sermons on this stuff back in the, the work of the Holy Spirit series from about three years back, if you want to see what what the, my teaching is on that, what, what I think the Bible says. But even when they are genuine, we need to remember that these are not the only things the Holy Spirit does. Some people seem to think that's all they do. That's all he does. In fact, they are far from the most important things. The most important things are, as we've just been reading, yes, we need to keep this in context, right? And the context is building a family of believers with the character traits that Paul's just been describing. That's the thing the Spirit does. It's the most important thing. So the Spirit works to convict of sin, to bring sinners into Christ, and then he continues to work in us to make us more faithful to him once we are in him, and therefore living lives that honor him, characterized by those things that we've been reading. Okay, that's the Holy Spirit's top job. And this is some of the things, and this is what we've just been talking about. Esteeming your elders, loving and encouraging each other, helping each other. What was it? Lifting, I think, lifting up, wasn't it? Um, Being patient, not taking revenge, doing good, rejoicing always, keep praying, and being thankful. These are, in a sense, fruits of the Spirit, aren't they? Yeah? In fact, there's a lot of in common between this list and the one that you t- typically call the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. I thought of trying to do it, link it up. There's actually nine elements there, but I've, some of them there's double. So, But there's a lot in common. And um, so that is, these are the main evidences of the Spirit working among a fellowship, right? If these things are happening, that's the evidence. It's not those other things as much. And so, yeah, these things, that's a list of what we've got so far. There's more coming, but um, you can add to that. So how do you think we are doing in those things as a church? Don't say it out loud. <laughs> Just think about it. So are we okay or are we quenching the spirit in some way? Now, I'm not suggesting one or the other where we're at, but just putting it out there for us to think about this morning. So, And, and in our own lives, of course, that's probably what we can actually change is our, our own lives. So let's think about how we're doing with those things. Okay, now with that said, Paul does use this point to move to talking about prophecies. So there is likely some link between that and what he says about the work of the Spirit, so let's not discount that. Because in verses 20 to 21 he says, Do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast what is good. Because Paul knows that if someone claims to speak a word from God, not all of them are actually doing so, right? Many of them were actually making stuff up in their own imaginations. Or worse, they were speaking words from demons. And there's a fair bit of uh, all that kind of stuff going on in certain parts of what we might call Christendom. But what we are to do, uh, or what are we to do about those kinds of claims? If someone claims to speak a word from God, like prophecy. So not to despise them. Don't reject them, reject them out of hand, but test them. Isn't that's the key thing? Test them. Weigh them up against the 100% reliable measuring stick of God's written word and see how they stack up. And if any part of it fails the test at all, 
then hey, it's not from God. And even more so if that person has any history of failed prophecies, right? Ignore them. But do note that we should hold on to the good. Whilst we keep in mind that prophecy is not only foretelling the future, okay, that's really only a small part of what's in view here. In Paul's mind, prophecy is simply relaying the word of God, whether that applies to past, present, or future. Okay? So if someone is preaching God's word accurately, then in a way that's being a good prophet in the sense that Paul's using it. Now, I run the danger of getting bogged down in a thousand qualifications if I go on more about this, so I'll move on to something that's always a good thing to do no matter what. Verse 22, abstain from every form of evil. Now, I was brought up thinking this verse said, abstain from all appearances of evil. So if the King James, that's kind of what it says. I'm not dissing the King James, I'm just saying that's what it how it's translated, but um, that kind of thing, that translation is suggesting that even if someone is likely to misinterpret your intentions through your actions, you shouldn't do it. Okay, so don't even go appearances of evil. But that's actually, I believe that's putting more restrictions in place than what the Greek phrase really means. The verse is pretty simple, really. Once you identify something that's evil, whatever it is, run away from it. That's basically all it's saying. So like Joseph, for example, with Potiphar's wife, when she came to try and seduce him, he didn't try and negotiate his way out of it, did he? No, he just ran. Get out of there. And that's often the best strategy when sin comes knocking. Okay, that's when sin does come knocking. But even better, if you can try and avoid the situation where sin is going to come knocking, where sin and evil are going to be lurking, try and stay out of that and avoid the trouble in the first place. Don't even put yourself in a vulnerable position. It's much easier to say no when you're not under the immediate pressure, isn't it? Make that decision before the time. And then when it does eventually come, then you'll be able to... You've already pre-planned how you're going to respond. So this was the overwhelming desire of Paul for his beloved Thessalonian church, that they, are, that they be as free as possible from sin and growing in Christ. And that's sort of one and the same thing there. As you move away from sin, you move towards Christ. So he breaks out into this kind of benediction prayer thing, but he's still speaking to his readers, but he's kind of um, to God as well at the same time. And keeping in mind that our series is called Living with Hope, so I do want you to see that hope really is at the heart of these words here. Verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now for those taking notes, you may recall that I've said Paul mentions the return of Jesus in some way or another in every chapter of this letter. So here it is in chapter 5. And the fact that he does that shows us something about what the bodily coming of Jesus is designed to be for us. See, It should be a motivation to holiness and placing more of our faith in him. And I talked last week about how it's, it's like the imminence of your returning parents when you're home alone, how that should motivate you to clean the house or you know, do something to get ready. Well, Paul sees Jesus coming in a similar kind of way. You know, Get prepared. It should keep us all focused and active because our complete refurbishment is coming in ourselves and, and the world eventually as well, but firstly ours. And the idea of completeness is quite prominent in verse 23 there, isn't it? Yeah. So, so God is planning to sanctify us completely, which means that during this current second phase of our salvation, that's called sanctification, hence sanctify there. So if we're believers, God is working by his spirit to mature us into the image of Christ, who are, you know, he, he's the one we're supposed to be resembling, right? So he's, um, that's the image we're aiming for. So completion there, so the end point, is full maturity in faith. That's what's in his mind. But he also says that our whole spirit, soul, and body, so the whole us, is to be blameless. So that is without blemish when Jesus comes. So not that we are perfectly sin-free in our behavior leading up to that moment, but that our whole being is prepared for acceptance by our King Jesus at the rapture. 
because keep in mind that Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that our current body will be changed at that moment in the twinkling of an eye and all that. So he's simply saying what the effect of that translation will be individually and as a group. Okay, So the group is the church and the dead and alive church. Remember, they all, we all go at the same time as we saw back in chapter 4. Uh, we will all be taken aside and taken up and all of our parts will at last be brought into perfect alignment with God's image and will. Which does beg the question, are we three parts in our being? So what's, what's the whole spirit, soul and body thing that he talks about there? Now there is much debate about that because other places seem to describe us as just our material part and our spiritual part or uh, material and immaterial part and some seem to use the terms spirit and soul interchangeably but I think that's failing to really um, get the distinction there so I suspect there's more to it and that the terms do imply different things when you look at the uses of each word in the Bible and to do this you have to go every appearance of the word spirit and every appearance of the word soul and you, you do word studies like that that's how you get to the bottom of these things and when you do that um, now, without going into all that, though, but I, I'm interested in this summary um, that I found of the three parts that Paul describes there, spirit, soul, and body. So here's a very brief general overview. So our spirit is our God consciousness. How we relate to him, how we relate to God. Yes, I know the word sounds a bit, you know, consciousness sounds a bit new agey, but I think it captures the flavor best. But if you don't like it, perhaps awareness, a God awareness, maybe. But I'll use consciousness here. So our spirit is our God consciousness. Our soul, if you want to think about which one that is, it's our self-consciousness. So it's kind of an inter interface between the other two. And our body is our world consciousness. So it's how we interact with the world, how we relate to the world around us physically, because it is physical. right? Now I'll leave you to play around with those. I just... I intend to have a look a bit more at that at this point. I haven't had a long chance to dig into all that stuff, but to me it just gives me some building blocks to work from, so see how you go. But I do find them a little helpful in trying to get to the bottom of what Paul's use of them is here. So Paul continues, verse 24, and here is the main thing we need to know about our promise-keeping God. He who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. So in other words, he's promised to transform you now by his spirit. And he's also promised to come in the future and finally transform you. So you can take that one to the bank. That would be a hypothetical heavenly bank. Um, I don't think you'd get far with Bank West on that one. So don't worry about taking that down there. But anyway, um, on to the close of the letter now. What kind of things does Paul want the Thessalonians to have in their minds since they can I finish the letter, put it down. What's, what does he want to take away? Verse 25, as he closes now, yep. Brothers, pray for us. So yes, apostles still need prayer. I mean, they're all dead now, but I mean, in the time that the Thessalonians were reading, they really needed prayer, the apostles, especially because the kind of persecution that the church was facing was even more intense on Paul and the other missionaries as the main spokesman of the new movement of God. He was the, you know, the head guy, really. So he copped most of the flack. And as always, this is a good reminder for us too. We all need to need the covering power of prayer because it's part of what helps keep, keep us all focused and listening to God. Because as I always like to remind us, prayer is not as much about changing God as it is about changing us, right? Bringing us in line with Him. In prayer, we will move closer to the will of God as we submit to His Spirit speaking to us. That's why I say... Carefully reading your Bible and letting it change you is, is a form of prayer in a sense because you're coming into his will. And praying for others does help them too, whether it be through you know, maybe the send angels support or something or however it works, we don't really know, but, but it is powerful and God wants us to talk to him and, and pray for other people and that does help. And we've, we've experienced that ourselves that when, you know, when someone's been praying for you, you just sometimes you can feel it. So it is powerful and it is important. Okay, so what else does he finish with? Verse 26. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. Now, do we disobey this one since we don't literally kiss each other very much? 
Well, no, because really the root of the Greek word for, the, for kiss is really referring to a general expression of fondness. Fondness. How to say that? Fondness. So it's, and it's a holy one, not a sensuous one, of course, the kiss in view. So some kind of expression of fondness, the holy way. So a handshake or a hug or a friendly wave could all qualify in our culture, depending on the occasion. I know some of them aren't COVID friendly, but whatever. Um, we do what we can in the, in the appropriate in the moment. So the point is to maintain that genuine warmth and affection amongst the spiritual family, right? That's, that's the point. But now Paul says something pretty strong straight off this verse 27. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters, of course. So he's pretty serious about making sure they read this to everyone. That's a pretty accurate translation, actually. Put you under oath, like you've got to do this. So why is that? Well, for one thing, if we look back at, to the Dark Ages, when the clergy were the only ones who were allowed to read the Bible, you know, they were called Dark Ages for a reason, right? <laughs> and they would do that so they could maintain their cult of control over the people. So perhaps that's some evidence as to why it's so important for people to have access to God's Word for themselves, where at all possible, and see the light for themselves. Another factor may be that since this was perhaps Paul's first canonical letter, unless Galatians is earlier, some say it is, but it's debatable, we're not sure, but certainly it was very early, Thessalonians. Uh, so he may have been trying to firmly set the precedent that his letters were made freely available to all and actually read out, and not hidden away for the select few. I think he was, perhaps he was, there's a bit of that in what he's saying there. And that's consistent with God's nature and his love, isn't it? You know, It's freely available to all who will accept it. So it's the same with his word. So that's what Paul's working consistently with. And that's grace as well, isn't it? It's grace. And it's very consistent also for Paul to sign off his letter like this, verse 28. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Now there's a whole bunch more we will say about that phrase when we get to 2 Thessalonians very soon. It turns out this is essentially Paul's trademark saying this, and for a very important reason, but you'll have to wait and see what that is. Okay, So it all ties into what's behind 2 Thessalonians, the 2 Thessalonians letter, which is shortly after the first one. So it's all in a close period of time. But for now, that's it for Paul, Silas, and Timothy's first letter to the Thessalonian church. So it's, all of them were there, but essentially Paul. I hope it's become clearer to you how the truth of both Christ's sacrifice and his return are fundamental to the hope that we have as believers. Since we saw how much Paul drew on that latter truth about the return, especially to substantiate his encouragements to them, you know, as we said, that's pretty strong in there. And as he signed off then, that that truth was also a key motivation for living a wholesome life with our spiritual brothers and sisters. So Jesus' return should inspire us to live more wholesome lives together. Because we need to remember God's goal in all this, which is what he said there at the end, to be able to present his son Jesus with a pure and beautiful bride one day. He didn't say bride specifically, but that's the goal, isn't it? So that's what this is all about. And that bride is the church. And if we believe we are part of that church, and the blessings in that are as incredible as they are eternal. Okay. So ultimately, nothing matters more than this final goal. So let's live our church life with that understanding and that hope as we await Jesus, our amazing Saviour and Lord. Let's pray. Lord, you are building a church. Lord, we don't see, as I say, we only see the back of the tapestry. Lord, we don't see the front, what it's going to look like in the end, but... Lord, we're a bunch of misfits in many ways, but thank you that you are building us together the way you want to do it. Help us, Lord, to just play our part, Lord, to be faithful to you, to stand up for you and your word, and to spend those times and, and that, that time with you individually and collectively, Lord. And we thank you for the reminder for that today and that your return is a great motivation of that. So we thank you for everything you, you've taught us this morning. And may we take these things and... May they make practical differences in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.